All right. Hello, Fortinas, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to Ministry Revealed. It is March 24th, 2024. And today you're going to notice by the by how short this one is today that today we are doing a shareable, what Ministry Revealed calls shareables. Uh, we don't do them. I don't do them too, too often, um, but I, I would like to do them more so that we can give something shorter to share with people on very, very key, key points of understanding. And some of what we're going to talk today, I'm going to build a little bit more, but we're going to cover a little bit of what I covered on um, a live show I did on Friday with the Bride of Christ channel. They had invited me over and they wanted to talk about um, uh, watching. And so we went into a lot of detail of that. And then later on, we went into another part in relation to nobody knows the day or hour. And we're going to talk a little bit about that to show what that's really about. But we're also going to talk about these comings of Christ and with a focus that will cover them all, but with a focus on the mid-trib portion of Christ's coming. And for those that might be new, you're going to hear something like that, and you're going to think, what is he talking about? Well, you're going to see that, in fact, pre, mid, and post are all true. And when we go into these scriptures, you're going to realize that so many of these things have been have been pushed off to the side because it wasn't really understood. And we've been breaking these things down and revealing them for the past six and a half years, and it has become so clear. It's so exciting when you understand it, and it draws you in closer and closer and closer and closer on a continuous basis because you can now understand what the Scriptures are talking about. You can understand these, these portions of time in relation to the end of days. And so... As I normally do, I'm just going to do it much quicker. If you're new to the channel, you definitely want to check out this playlist right here on the YouTube channel and watch the first four videos. The other place you can go is the website here, ministryrevealed.com, and go to this intro page right here. When you go to the intro, you're going to see the first four videos. That's what you want to start with. The first one is a 22-minute intro. The next one is 30 minutes, a Bible study, about this, these differences that are in the Gospels with a focus on the Synoptic Gospels that will blow your mind. You're going to come to see that everybody's focus has been on Matthew for centuries, and it was never really understood who Mark and who Luke were speaking to in the Synoptic Gospels. When you understand, uh, having noticed that there's these differences within the same storylines, it leaves many people who study Scripture scratching their heads. Well, what you're going to realize here is that it is all prophecy. It is 100%. Every one of these differences are prophecy. We have revealed dozens and dozens and dozens of them. This is just a simple 30-minute Bible study intro to begin to help you understand. And when you realize it, that, you know, when scriptures say the last will be first, the first will be last, well, get ready. Because Matthew, Mark, Luke, in the end, is Luke, Mark, Matthew. And when you realize these differences in the Gospels, you'll realize that there's a difference in the, synop uh, in the discourses of the three Gospels as well. And when you realize that, what you realize next, after understanding the differences within the Gospels and how they're speaking prophetically, you'll realize that the end of days is a period called 14 years. There's a short period called above, which is 50 days, and then it's seven years of seals and seven years of trumpets. Once you realize this, you will begin to see why everybody is able to argue their points from Scripture for pre-trib, mid-trib, and post-trib. And when you see it, I promise you, you will be so excited to understand in a way that you've never been able to see and comprehend before. From here, this is the fourth video. This one is also a 30-minute Bible study, so very straightforward, very simple to follow. This one is a big one. It's about 2 hours and 45 minutes. As you can see from the title, it's all because of Matthew. Because Mark and Luke were, were lesser re referenced to, it was never really understood that they were speaking to different groups of people. We've all been taught for hundreds of years from a foundation of Matthew's gospel. 
And so with that foundation, what you're really seeing in relation to prophecy, what you're really seeing in relation to the end of days is the period of Matthew's seven years of trumpets. We've missed what Mark's portion is about, which is the seven years of seals, and Luke's portion, which is the pre-trib, and then a period of days, which is 50 days. It's eye-opening. It's, it's hard to comprehend when you, when you first hear it. It's quite jarring, but I promise you it is all true, and we've been able to reveal hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of scriptures, over 600 videos here in the ministry for the last six and a half years. It is packed, and it is every with every new piece of Revelation, it fits. From the beginning of Genesis to the end of Revelation, everything continues and has continued since the beginning to fall in place exactly where it should line up within the timeline of the end of days. It is that powerful, and this will help you understand how these things were missed. How was it possible? Yet we could see pre, mid, and post in like the in the other parts of the God, of scripture in the epistles and so forth but because of our focus on Matthew and we've all been taught from it we don't realize who Matthew is speaking to even though we realize it's to the Jews we because we haven't understood Mark and Luke everything has been focused on Matthew and the world didn't even know it so this is really really going to open up your understanding in a way like nothing ever has before. But before you get there, you need to start with these other short videos. 22 minutes, 30 minutes, 30 minutes, and then this is the big one. All right? So with that, the other thing I want to share with you guys is, you know, a number of people have su uh, support the ministry here, and we're grateful. There's always, always, always a need for support. Whether it's the bills here, which isn't as much of a need, as it is for what we send to Uganda. This is our brother Steve in Uganda. You guys know that uh, we had raised some money for a wheelchair and some supplies for this school and for this boy. This young boy right here, see how smiley is? Steve was saying he's always just a happy boy. He was crawling to school. He would get to school and his clothes would be all messed up because he couldn't walk and he would drag his feet crawling on his hands to school every day to and from. So this was very powerful to see. And our brother Steve, and uh, one of his, his brothers or uh, part of the ministry there, it, I think it's like a seven-hour drive for them to get to where this boy was to bring them the wheelchair. They put it on the back of their motorcycle, and off they went. So they brought him, as you can see, they brought him the wheelchair. They brought some supplies. They did some teachings. Uh, they, I, they think they may have even brought some clothes and so forth. So it really, really is powerful it reaches people, brothers and sisters, and it's just so, so exciting. I'm so grateful to be a part of it with each of you, and I thank you for that. And please, if you're feeling led, please continue to support. You can even do it right here um, on Ministry Revealed from the website. Uh, you just saw Donate there. Uh, or you can go, uh, as you'll see on the website, you can just come right here to PayPal. All right. It's also on YouTube and the links are there on YouTube. You can do that as well uh, because there's always a need. They're always traveling. They're always going out and doing mission trips and, and teachings. It's it's absolutely fantastic. So the other thing now that I wanted to share is this right here. So this was a just a great simple idea by our brother Jimmy, who does our website. He, our website is fantastic. And our brother Jimmy does it, man. He's a genius with that stuff. And he put this together for us as well. Just a simple thing to post on our Facebook channels, uh, on our Facebooks, on, on Twitter, on whatever you guys have. Things that we could share with people. Just They won't even necessarily know what it is except Scripture, that it's for Scripture, of course. But to get them to come and visit ministryrevealed.com. Whether they come to the website or whether it leads them to come and check out the YouTube channel so that we can lead people into these revelations that are being revealed and get a bunch more people prepared. So you'll be able to find this link. It'll be in the description box under this video. It, I'm not sure if it'll, if it'll pop up under all the other videos now. Um, it may, the way I've set it up. But it will be in the description box under this video. So when you, know, when you click on a video, let me show you, for example. All right, hello, 14. When you click on a video, 
and you go into the description box you click on more and then you see all this listed below so there's our shipping address uh we have paypal there as well and then as you scroll down you'll see it right here where did i put oh yeah that's right it's not in this one yet you'll see it in these links right here okay so it'll be one of these links and you can just click it you can download it and once it's downloaded you can go and share it anywhere as well and maybe we can use that to to reach more people and come check out ministry revealed so with that sip of coffee time let's get into it let me close this one off that takes a lot of juice let's start with the this info about the day and hour no one knows you know i don't want to spend too much time on the meaning of day and hour no one knows because it's something we've broken down many times we know that the revelation the understanding of the day and hour no one knows is talking about the feast of trumpets it is the one festival that is the day and hour no one knows they don't know if it'll happen on the first or the second date based on the spotting the crescent of the moon and the blowing of the trumpet so once you begin to understand that matthew mark and luke in the end of days are luke mark and matthew and you, you've gone to that intro series and you see simple things like one of the simplest ones that we always like to say is how jesus before going to the cross was arrayed in a gorgeous robe which means white radiant beautiful okay that's like a bridal gown right in mark he was arrayed in purple and in matthew he was arrayed in scarlet well luke in a gorgeous white robe means it is like a bridal gown that's the pre-trib that it's talking to when you go to mark it's purple and matthew it's scarlet well all you got to do is go to revelation and see the woman riding the beast and she's arrayed in purple and scarlet this is these are the simple little things that you'll come to see that are these differences within the gospels that once you see them and once you begin to understand them it will blow your mind and you will see the end of days being revealed within the gospels not only from the discourses but once you can see it within the synoptic gospels the discourses will explode open for you and one of them is when you realize the pre mid and post of luke mark and matthew you'll notice that in luke's discourse we come to luke 21 34 through 36 right don't be caught off guard so that that day come upon you unawares for as a snare shall it come upon all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth the whole world is going to be caught off guard on this day when tens of millions of people vanish it says in verse 36 watch ye therefore and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the son of man so when luke's talking about this to escape all these things that shall come to pass it's talking about everything in luke's discourse so to escape all of these things that are about to come to pass luke's is the only one where all the events that are described in luke's discourse you're to escape them even before it happens and when you understand that luke's discourse is talking about the period of time of the above 14 years the the 50 days that comes first you will understand that the pre-trib is going to happen before the 50 days begin right right before the 50 days begin the pre-trib is gone the pre-trib what we call the escape of the bride of christ because it's not called a rapture it's called like a rapture okay it's the pre-trib escape when you hear me saying like a rapture i'll give you an example this is now we know this was paul in an experience and either it was relating to himself or to someone he was talking about but it is also prophecy built within it prophecy is way more than what we've been taught in scripture uh, uh from pastors it is way beyond just some parts and pieces like a third of the book it's more like half or almost all of the bible that is filled with prophecy it is way more than a third of it and we've shown that here and this is another example this is paul in second corinthians 12 2 i knew a man in christ above that's the above 14 years ago whether in the body out of the body i cannot tell such in one which means like a caught up 
like a harpazo, which is the Greek word for rapture. So this is the Luke pre-trib. Watch and pray always that you may be accounted worthy before it all starts, above the 14 years. Then it says, and I knew such a man. You see, the second one isn't in Christ. It's kind of like the first one, but they're not really quite as in Christ. This is the was caught up to paradise. The first one goes to the third heaven. The second group, which is the mid-trib great multitude rapture, the was caught up is going to paradise. So you have a taking, a taking, and then you have a return with him saying, behold, the third time I'm ready to come to you. So it's Paul in this story, like a, like a Christ typology of the three comings, uh, of the three pre, mid, and posts. A taking, a taking, and then we know the post is his return, feet down on the Mount of Olives. He will no longer be a burden to them and so forth. This is where you can clearly understand when you spend a little time delving more into prophecy, it's all right here. All three of them are true. And what you notice is that in Luke's gospel, in Luke's discourse, you see nothing about, but of that day and hour knows no man. Now when we go to Mark's, in Mark's discourse, we see the day and hour no one knows. In Mark 13, 32. But of that day and of that hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. Take heed, take ye heed, watch and pray, for you know not when the time is. Okay, you don't know when the time is, but if you're watching, you see, if you understand the day and hour, you will understand when it's coming. You won't know the exact time. But the day and hour no one knows is only a period of two days. So when, once you understand this and you understand that the Luke portion, which is the pre-trib happens first, and then you have Luke's discourse, do you know what it happens when it comes to Mark's discourse is this is the timing of the coming of the Son of Man. So watch what happens here. When it says the day and hour no one knows, we have the story a little bit further up at the coming of the Son of Man. Okay? That means Mark's group, the, the sleeping church, the world that is going to be caught off guard, that will come to repentance and come to Christ in the midst of seals, they're going to go through these things, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, the beginnings of sorrows. They're going to go through all of these things. The abomination of desolation which in Mark is the mark of the beast. It's going to be a terrible time. At about mid-seals, the false Christ and false prophet is going to show up. And then at the end of six years, we've shown this through other teachings, at the end of six years, the Son of Man is going to be coming, and it says that he's coming in, which is the word 1722. It means in the clouds, plural, with power and glory, in great glory. And then what does it say? That that time is going to be the day and hour no one knows. So what most people think here is that the day and hour no one knows, if they understand it's the Feast of Trumpets, many people will say, ah, the pre-trib is going to happen at the Feast of Trumpets. But they fail to understand what coming this is. And they'll tie it in to Matthew's gospel. But it stands on its own. The wordings are different. Let me give you another example of the difference in wordings. You saw in Mark, it said in the clouds, plural. If we go back to the first one in Luke, we end up seeing that it says at the coming of the Son of Man, it says in verse 27, and then shall they see the Son of Man coming in. So it's the same word as Mark's, but it says a cloud singular. So you have a different pre-event and you have a different mid-event. Okay? And you see that the day and hour no one knows, if you spend a little time in researching, you will know, you will see, and you will understand that it's going to be at the Feast of Trumpets. But what happens is most people think 
that the Feast of Trumpets is when the Lord's coming. So whether it's pre or whether it's mid or whether it's post for somebody's belief, when they read about the day and hour no one knows, they believe it's the pre, the mid, or the post, meaning the pre-trib vanishing of people, or if their belief is mid-trib, they believe it's the mid-trib vanishing of people, or if they're post-trib, they believe it's the post-trib gathering to the Lord. In neither of those cases is it true. Because what you come to understand as you go through the revelations that we've shown here in these videos, you will see that the day and hour that no one knows, which is the Feast of Trumpets for Mark, which happens after the six years of seals, which means it goes to the end of the sixth seal, not because every seal equals one year. One will start and end, another will start, another one will overlap, some will start, some will, will pause, then pick up again. It's not one seal per year, but it equals that at the end of the sixth seal, it's the end of the first six years of seals. And this coming of the Lord at the end of the sixth year of seals is not the mid-trib rapture. It's simply the coming of the Lord. They're going to see him coming at this point. And when they see him coming, they're expecting at this point that it'll be their mid-trib great multitude rapture. But it still doesn't happen for a few months. We'll talk about that in a moment. Now look what happens when we go to Matthew chapter 24. In Matthew chapter 24, we have... At the coming of the Son of Man, it says, Then shall it appear in the clouds, then shall they see the Son of Man coming in. Well, remember, Luke and Mark were the word in, and it was 1722. Luke was a single cloud, Mark was plural clouds. So something different is going on there. Well, again, the wording in Matthew is very different from both of them. And it the word in isn't actually the word in. Can you believe that? You know how much easier life would have been for people in prophecy? If they had realized that the word in, in Matthew 24, is actually the word on, man, that would change people's prophecy understanding, wouldn't it? They would no longer be saying, hey, see, this is the Lord coming pre-trib in Matthew 24. No, it's post-trib when he's coming on the clouds, plural. So we had in a single cloud, in a plural clouds, and on the clouds, plural. Clearly. When he's returning feet down on the Mount of Olives and it's at the great sound of a trumpet and the great sound of a trumpet is blown on the day and hour that no one knows. And so what happens is everybody's looking within this understanding of day and hour no one knows. And the church will tell you, hey, nobody knows the day and hour, so don't worry about trying to figure it out. Well, no, that, that's not at all what it says. The day and hour is talking about the Feast of Trumpets. However, it's kind of good that the church teaches like that because everybody thinks the day and hour no one knows means nobody can understand when it's going to come because they associate it to pre-trib or if their belief is mid-trib. And in neither case is it about the pre-trib or the mid-trib. So could you imagine everybody's looking every year for the Feast of Trumpets and they would be wrong? Because the pre-trib is 50 days before the Feast of Trumpets. The mid-trib is about six months after his coming, in the midst of the seventh year, after he's come, at the end of the sixth year of seals, in the clouds, plural, for Mark. And in Matthew, it is when he comes feet down on the Mount of Olives, but he's not gathering the people to himself yet. You see, you have to understand there's a lot of mysteries because at this point here, the Lord isn't coming at the end of the 14th year. He's coming at the end of the 13th year or the end, you could say, at the end of the sixth year of trumpets. So just like he came at the end of the sixth year of seals, there will be other events that take place and then he's gone and he's going to come back, but this time feet down on the Mount of Olives for all to see as lightning from one end unto the other on the day and hour that no one knows. From that point, as we've discussed many times, then it will be as it was in the days of Noah. And the days of, excuse me, in the days of Noah was one year and 10 days long, which is precisely 
the length of the final year of a seven-year Shemitah cycle, seven Sabbath years, seven times seven years, because on the 10th day of the new year from Tishri, from, from Feast of Trumpets, after he comes on the day and hour no one knows, it's a year and 10 days, and on the 10th day they sound the horn for the Jubilee, the trumpet of the Jubilee. So when do the people get gathered at the pre-trip, I mean at the post-trip? Is it going to be when he comes feet down on the Mount of Olives? Well, no, it isn't, because he's coming at the end of the sixth year of trumpets, which is the end of the 13th year of tribulation, and there's still one more year, which is as it was in the days of Noah. And so how do we know that he's not also gathering a people to him at the same time when he comes feet down on the Mount of Olives? Well, we know it from Revelation chapter 12, verse 14. When Satan's cast down at mid-trumpets at the first woe, he has a short time. And if we go to Daniel, I'm not going to go too far in the weeds on this, but if we go into Daniel chapter 12, we know that Satan's time is going to be for time, times, and a half. There's no end here, so there's no addition. It's one, two, plus a half. So there's going to be two and a half years, which is the period of time of Satan's short period that Revelation chapter 12 says that he's going to have a short time. But when he comes... At mid trumpets, he's going to go after the woman who is going to be, uh, who is going to, uh, and to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness unto her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time. Which means from mid trumpets, she is now taken to a place of protection for the final three and a half years, which means until the end of the 14th year. While Matthew chapter 24 is telling us that the Lord is coming at the end of the 13th year. And it's going to be at the day and hour no one knows, for which then you have the one year and 10 days of Noah. Which means at the end of that one year and then the 10 days of the shofar blast on atonement for the jubilee to begin that is when they're going to come back from that place in the wilderness where they were protected for the revelation 12 14 time and times and half a time so what you understand is that where we see the day and hour no one knows in mark and in matthew neither of them have anything to do with a pre-trib taking of people or a mid-trib taking of people, and even in the post-trib in relation to a taking of people. So what is it telling us about? It's telling us the comings of the Lord. That's what it's telling us. Let me show you this in Mark. In Mark, in the same places we just covered, when it says, in those days after that tribulation, so the word for that tribulation is different than what we see in Matthew, which says immediately after the tribulation of those days. Mark's is immediately after that tribulation, which means there was a specific portion, a specific tribulation that has come to an end after that tribulation. And when you understand that it's the end of the sixth year of seals, which is the end of the sixth seal, and he's coming in the clouds. Well, what are people to understand? What on earth is it that he's coming in the clouds? You see, you have to understand, the reason people are so confused in these things and have missed it is because all of their focus has been on Matthew. So when wording in Mark or wording in Luke doesn't line up, they just don't go to it. And they stick with Matthew. That's what you have to do. <clears throat> if you don't understand why there's a difference in wording, but you're, you're confident with the one that you understand and, and the world has been teaching for hundreds of years from Matthew, you tend to then just revert back to the Matthew one because the Mark and Luke one aren't lining up and making sense. There's, there's too many little differences. So once you understand that this coming in the clouds 
of Mark's discourse is at the end of six years of seals and you go to Revelation chapter 6 and you get to the end of it in verse 16 listen to what it says verse 16 and 17 and said to the mountains and rocks fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb for the great day of his wrath is come this is the wrath of the lamb you know it's funny that we we see this is the wrath of the lamb but most people within prophecy what they have to do is they they sandwich seals and trumpet judgments together so they they overlay it like a sandwich and say first seal first trumpet uh second seal second trumpet why do they do that for the exact same reason they keep doing everything from matthew they haven't understood mark's portion and they haven't understood luke's portion so look at this great day of the lamb what is this great day that is the wrath of the lamb well let's have a look if we go to daniel let me go up here first if we go to daniel chapter 7 we see that there were four beasts all right there were four great beasts this is the beginning of seals we've discussed many times the lion is going to be Assad destroying Jerusalem at the beginning of the 14 years on the day and hour no one knows. Then you've got the bear, which is Russia. you got the leopard, which is probably through that grouping with the World Economic Forum. <clears throat> and then you've got the fourth beast. And this fourth beast is the beast that has the ten horns. What the beast of Revelation 13 talks about when he will overtake the lion, the bear, and the leopard. And they will all be under his control when he comes as the fourth beast. Now, remember, he has ten horns. He's going to have control. He's going to have power and authority until the thrones were cast down and the Ancient of Days did sit whose garment was white as snow. We see that uh, thousand of thousands ministered unto him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set and the books were open. Then we see in verse 11, Daniel 7, And I beheld then, because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake, I beheld even till the beast was slain. At this point, we're seeing that the beast is killed and was given to the burning flame. As concerning the rest of the beasts, they had their dominions taken away and their lives were prolonged for a season and time. And then we see one like the Son of Man come with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days and they brought him near and there was dominion and glory and a kingdom that was given unto him. This, of course, is the Lord and it's all about him coming with the clouds of heaven. This is all in relation to the end of seals when we know that the beast is killed. And without going too far down that road, when you go to Revelation, actually, we'll probably touch on it, because when you go to Revelation 17, you see where the beast is no longer, but you know that he's coming back. So what is taking place here? What is this wrath of the lamb? Well, remember a few things here. Remember that the beast had 10 horns. We know that the beast ends up dying. And we know that the son of man is had come on the clouds, is given dominion and glory. Now, if we go to Daniel chapter 2, and we see the story of Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Listen to what happens. We're even told that it's in the latter days. In Daniel 2.28, But there is a God in heaven that revealed the secrets, and maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. Thy dream and visions of thy head upon thy bed are these. So was it in his day? Yes, of course it was in his day, but it's also prophecy for the latter days. We get the description of the image of the beast, right? We see that it was the head of gold, uh, breast and arms of silver, belly and his thighs of brass, the legs of iron, and the feet part of iron and part of clay. 
And then what does it say? Verse 34 of Daniel 2. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut without hands, which smote the image upon the feet that were uh, of iron and clay and break them in pieces. Now, what does he break in pieces that are of iron and clay? The toes, right? He's breaking the toes. How many toes are there? Well, of course, there were 10 toes. We'll see that in a bit. So then he, and he smashes the toes and breaks them in pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, the gold broken into pieces together and became chaff as the summer threshing floor. And the wind carried them away that no place was found for them. And the stone that smot the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Then you get the description of it, right? Watch this. We get the description, and what do we find out? That the part of iron and part of clay, with the potter's clay, is related to what? Ten toes. Ten toes. How many horns does the beast have? Ten horns. So we've got ten toes. We've got ten horns. We've got the beast. What is the beast in the end of days? It is the image, right? It is the vain show. It is the image, which is the beast of the end of days. And the beast in the end of days is given to us as having 10 horns. Well, if this is where Christ is coming to destroy the, the image of the beast, and he smashes the 10 toes, and he's doing it with what? With a stone that became a great mountain, and he's smashing the toes and all the image falls, well then, what's just been destroyed? The beast. The beast has just been destroyed, and what was it when Christ comes and he smashes it? What does he smash? Does he smash it on the head and it all comes crumbling down? No. He smashed the toes, right? Which smote the image upon the feet. The feet that were part of iron and part of clay. He destroys the feet where the toes are. So he's destroying the ten toes and the whole thing comes crumbling down, which is the beast and a representation of the beast system. And we saw in Daniel 7 where the beast was killed. We saw that the beast in Daniel 7 had ten horns. Now watch this. Let's take this to Revelation. We go to Revelation chapter 17, and look what happens. In Revelation chapter 17, we see the story of the beast in verse 8. The beast that you saw was, okay? This is what we're talking about. In that second half of seals, when he shows up, that's the was. And then look what it says, is not. Why is not? Well, I just explained it. We saw the Lord at the end of Mark's discourse. The Lord coming on the day and hour no one knows. He's coming. It's the day of the wrath of the Lamb of God. And when he comes on the day of the wrath, he's coming as a stone that will destroy the feet with the toes and the image of the beast, the beast will be destroyed so that what happens is for the sec first half of trumpets that's coming, the, first seven, or the next seven years, which is the first half of trumpets, he is not. This is because he was killed at the end of the was, which is the end of seals. We can prove it, excuse me, we can prove it even here as we continue reading. And then it says, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. Which means he's going to come back when the pit is opened. We know that the pit is opened at the fifth trumpet, which is called the first woe, and it will equal the middle of the seventh year of trumpet judgments, which is going to be about ten and a half years into all of tribulation. But let's see this beast that was, why he is not, like we just saw in Daniel 7. We saw it in Daniel 2. So we see the ten toes and the picture of the ten horns, and the ten toes were destroyed. The ten horns are killed when the beast is killed. 
How do we know where that is? Well, watch what happens. Right here. Revelation 17, 12. Then the ten horns, or in the picture of the image, you could say the ten toes, which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the Lord God, the Lord God Almighty. Nope. With the lamb. Remember what happens at the end of the sixth seal? For the great wrath of the lamb is come and who shall stand? He's going to fight against those ten kings, those ten toes. He's going to smash them with that stone that's coming. That becomes a great mountain. Listen to what it says. These shall make war with the lamb, and the lamb shall overcome them. For he is Lord of lords and king of kings. You see, all lowercase except uppercase over the little lords, uppercase K over the little kings. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. This war right here is what you're seeing of the stone's throw from Daniel chapter 2 and or, or from the yeah not the stone's throw but the 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 stone that became a great mountain from Daniel 2 and it's the destruction of the beast that you saw with 10 horns in Daniel 7 so now when you come back to Mark 13 and you understand what's going on here and you see excuse me and you see the coming of the Son of Man in the clouds, plural. So he's not going to be seen or the whole world's going to see him as lightning from one end to the other, but something is going to be seen coming. And he's coming at the day and hour no one knows. But it's not the rapture. It's the timing of his coming, which is the end of the sixth year of seals. So when we go back now to the end of the sixth year of seals, we know that the world is going to see something coming that is freaking them out. It's going to be probably this massive stone that looks like a mountain that becomes a great mountain. Now you have to ask yourself a question. Knowing that, knowing that Daniel describes it as the stone that's going to become a great mountain, does that sound to you like the Lord coming feet down on the Mount of Olives? Absolutely not. You see, this is the dilemma. People will go to Daniel chapter 2, and they'll, they'll try to show that that stone coming is in relation to the Lord at the end of tribulation when he comes feet down on the Mount of Olives. Yet, that's not his coming feet down on the Mount of Olives. And when you understand that you can connect it to the, the ten horns of when he's coming and they're going to fight against them, and you know that it's the wrath of the lamb, that it's the lamb who destroys them, how can somebody turn around and then go to Revelation 19 and talk about the war that he makes when his vestiture is dipped in blood at the treading of the winepress in the wrath of Almighty God? How is it both? How could, how could prophecy teachers ever explain this as being the same thing? It's not. That's why when you see here, look at this, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, all uppercase. And even the battle is a different battle. People haven't understood that. So now when we see this in Mark, and we know that he's coming with this, with this stone, that's going to become a great mountain that smashes the image, that smashes the ten toes as the Revelation 17 one, where the beast that was is now no longer. Now things will start to make a little bit more sense. When you go to Revelation chapter 14, look what happens next. In Revelation 14 one, it says, And I looked and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion. And with them, the 144,000, having his father's name written in their foreheads. So, what is the Lord doing standing on Mount Zion? You see? 
shouldn't this this should have been a question that everybody who studies prophecy should ask everybody who is talking about prophecy what is the lamb doing on mount zion with the 144,000 who are about to go out and start the seven years of trumpets what's he doing on mount zion with them if the lord isn't coming back till he returns feet down on the mount of olives so now watch this where why was he standing well when we were in revelation 6 we saw the wrath of the lamb him coming we now know what it is we know it's the stone that became a great mountain destroyed the ten toes de destroyed the ten horns in the in the revelation we know it was the it was the battle of the lamb and then we see that this stone became a great mountain which yes it is mount zion that he's come with because remember the second group remember the second group they're going to paradise which means the lord is coming with heavenly mount zion with paradise he's coming to gather then the great multitude rapture to paradise exactly like he told them in john chapter 14 that i go and prepare a place for you listen to what it says <clears throat> 14, uh, john 14 2 through 4 in my father's house are many mansions if it were not so i would have told you i go to prepare a place for you if i go and prepare a place for you i will come again and receive you unto myself that where i am there you may be also hello he's gonna what come again to receive them unto himself with the place that he had prepared pretty wild right now watch this we've talked in this this is from the the apocrypha of second esdras in chapter 13 starting in, in 29 this is the pre-trib right here in verse 29 behold the days are coming when the most high will deliver those who are on the earth and bewilderment of mind shall come upon all those that dwell on the earth this is the luke when the whole world is caught off guard when the pre-trib has happened then the red horse the nation against nation they're going to plan and shortly after which is going to be feast of trumpets nation against nation city against city it will begin with the attack on jerusalem on the feast of trumpets the day and hour no one knows that will begin the 14 years then all the events that talk that take place during seals happen and then will my son be revealed and it says in verse 33 and when all nations hear his voice every man shall leave his own land and the warfare they had against one another and here's those ten toes or those ten horns and an innumerable multitude shall be gathered together as you as you saw desiring to come to conquer him listen to this but he shall stand on top of mount of olives no nope. mount zion and zion will come to be made manifest to all people listen to this prepared and built what did he say in Matt, in john 14 that he would return again and receive them unto himself to the place that he had prepared when at the end of the sixth year of seals he's coming on heavenly mount zion that stone that's going to become a great mountain after he conquers the ten kings and the beast he's going to then be gathering them to himself and it says as you saw here it is the daniel 2 1 the mountain carved without hands but what do we know happens first we know that if you go into revelation after revelation 6 there he was coming he destroyed the enemies we we can see now that he's on mount zion this heavenly mount zion coming down which is the place prepared we saw that in revelation 14 there he was on mount zion with the 144,000. well what happens in revelation 7 after that sixth year here they are sealing the 144,000 before the great multitude rapture pretty wild right you see how that happens this is the revelation of mark's discourse this coming of the lord this coming of the son of man in the clouds is the end of the sixth year of seals which is the wrath of the lamb it's him coming on heavenly mount zion where he will then after the 144 are sealed in the midst of the seventh year of seals 
he's going to bring then the great multitude. He's going to gather the great multitude in the mid-trib great multitude rapture to paradise, which is heavenly Mount Zion that he came down with, the place prepared and built. This is his coming. It's on the day and hour no one knows, but this has nothing to do with a mid-trib gathering to him. It's when the world sees this coming at the end of the sixth year of seals. Now watch this, because this is the one everybody misses, because they haven't understood Mark. When we now go to Zechariah chapter 8, listen to what happens. You see, we saw the end of the sixth year. They're all freaking out. It's the wrath of the Lamb. We showed what the wrath of the Lamb was. He makes war and destroys those ten toes or ten horns and kills the beast. So the beast that was no longer is. He, they seal the 144. The 144 are on Mount Zion with them. Jesus said that when he returns, he's going to gather them to this place that he had prepared. The Apocrypha confirms that this place that he had prepared is heavenly Mount Zion, which is the place prepared, which was the, the, the mountain carved without hand, which is what confirms in Daniel, telling us this is clearly the end of the sixth year and into the seventh year of seals. So now, what's happened now is now we've come to the end of seals. That seventh year, the 144, heavenly Mount Zion is there. The 144 have been sealed and are gathered to the Lord. The great multitude rapture happens. We go to the end. There's the seventh seal, and it's the end of the seven years of seals. Now trumpets begins. Now we're going into the time of Matthew's discourse. And here's what happens. You see how the whole world tells us in prophecy that the temple has to be built first. And then once the temple is built, the, the Antichrist who built it will then step into it and declare himself to be God. But if you go through all of Scripture and through all of history of Scripture, not one single temple was built by the enemy. Not one was built by Lucifer or by Satan. Never. They were built by the ones who the Lord had commissioned every single time. Well, guess what? Here we are now in Zechariah chapter 8. Zechariah chapter 8 is now a picture of the beginning of the seven years of trumpets, which is Matthew's portion of seven years. So when the world of church, of prophecy, tells you that the tribulation is seven years, they will almost always tell you that the temple must be built first. Well, guess what? Here we are in now the beginning of the seven years of the trumpet judgments after the seals are done and all the events that we discussed, which means the Lord is now here on heavenly Mount Zion. Now what's going to happen? The rebuilding of the temple. Listen to what it says in Zechariah chapter 8, starting in verse 2. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I was jealous for Zion with great jealousy and was jealous for her with a great fury. Thus saith the Lord, I am returned unto Zion and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem and Jerusalem shall be called a city of truth and the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. Why do people miss this? Why does everybody skip? to Zechariah chapter 14. I don't understand. If, if they read the seven chapters earlier, they would see events playing out in the end of days. But what they can't comprehend, which is why they don't go to this, is they can't comprehend how the Lord is going to be there on heavenly Mount Zion when it then says, listen to this. Let's start in verse 8. And I will bring them and they shall dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God in truth and in righteousness. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, listen to this, let your hands be strong, you that hear in these days these words by the mouth of the prophets which were in the day that the foundation of the Lord of hosts, of hosts was laid that the temple might be built. 
which means we've got teachings on this, but the foundation only gets laid in the midst of seals. Everything else doesn't happen. They will begin to build the temple now in the beginning of the seven years of trumpets once the seven years of seals are done. And he confirms it to us in verse 10 by saying in Zechariah 8 verse 10, for before these days, there was no hire for man nor any hire for beast. Neither was there any peace to him that went, came in or went out, uh, that went out or came in. Remember at the red horse rider, peace is removed because of the affliction for I set all men, everyone against his neighbor. This is the red horse rider. Peace is taken from the earth and he set everyone against his neighbor. So the world of church tells you in the seven years of tribulation, the temple has to be built first. Well, they're right. But unfortunately, they haven't understood Mark's portion. They've missed that there's seven years of seals. As you have just seen, how do you get the Lord who's returned on Mount Zion? Now you understand. Now you can see. Now you can understand. And we've shown that the, the one who's going to be in charge of rebuilding is whoever the modern day typology of Zerubbabel will be. And the, the Messiah is here. The Lord has come down as we've seen. We know he's there on Mount Zion. It's because that is when he comes as high priest and King Melchizedek. He is going to be the one over the 144,000. He is going to be the one higher than the Zerubbabel type. Just like when you go and read in Zechariah chapter 6, which is a picture of the Lord coming at the end of the sixth seal. And you've got Zerubbabel and, and Joshua, the high priest and king. Christ is now high priest and king. And he's there with the 144,000 who follow him wheresoever he goes. While Zerubbabel is going to be the one in charge of overseeing the rebuilding of the temple because it tells us in Zechariah 4 that Zerubbabel was the one who laid the foundation and that he would be the one to finish it. This is how you understand these things. So now you can see how the Lord is there on Mount Zion. This is why the whole world misses it. Because we've all been told in prophecy teachings that the Lord doesn't return till he comes feet down on the Mount of Olives at the end. I've just shown you, you've just seen here from the word, clearly revealed scripture by scripture, showing you how the Lord is now at the beginning of trumpets there on Mount Zion. And now the temple is about to be rebuilt. And why it couldn't be rebuilt before? Listen to what it says. For I set all men, everyone against his neighbor. That is precisely nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. Fascinating, isn't it? Right there. So, now, what does this mean? Let's go into Matthew's discourse. We know that the Lord is now here. He's here from the end of the sixth seal, destroys the enemies. We know, we know that he's here for a period of time before the pit opens, which means during the first half of the seven years of trumpet judgments, which means year eight, nine, ten and a half, plus the seventh year of seals, the Lord is here. He's here on Mount Zion. So you see how hard this is as we try to reach many people because everything they've learned is from the Gospel of Matthew. Their prophetic foundation comes from Matthew 24. You'll hear it like a broken record. Matthew 24, Matthew 24, Matthew 24. It's a broken record. They haven't understood the rest. And so... As you start to come into this understanding, it's hard to realize and to wrap your head around the fact that the Lord is coming pre, he's here at mid, and he's here for a few years before he's cut off, and then will return feet down on the Mount of Olives at the end of Matthew's portion, at the end of six years of Matthew's portion. So now watch what happens in Matthew. We saw 
that the beginning of the seven years of trumpet judgments or the eighth year of tribulation now is established on the on Mount Zion. You see, at no point did it say Mount of Olives yet. It's all Mount Zion. And so what happens? Now the events of trumpets take place, the rebuilding of the city and the streets and the temple. The temple will be finished getting rebuilt by mid trumpets and the abomination of desolation in matthew is when the pit is opened at the first woe when satan was cast down this is when messiah gets cut off and now you see the wording difference compared to marks which said standing where it ought not matthews says stand in the holy place because the holy place the temple will have now been rebuilt so we know Satan's time, we saw that once the pit is opened, and we saw from Daniel that he's given two and a half years, which goes from mid-trumpets, ten and a half years of tribulation, gives him two and a half years, which is to the end of the 13th year of tribulation, or to the end of the sixth year of the trumpet judgments. And listen to what it says at the coming of the Lord. Immediately after... The tribulation of those days. See that? Different than the one we covered in Mark's earlier. And as you saw already, it says, Then shall they see the Son of Man coming in, which is the word on the clouds. So if he's coming on the clouds this time, that means that this is immediately after the tribulation of the sixth seal, that the Son of Man is going to be seen coming on the the clouds and it's going to be with the great sound of a trumpet well if you go to revelation chapter 10 you see when everything is over it says in verse 7 of revelation 10 and in the days of the voice of the sound uh, sorry in the days of the voice of the seventh angel when he shall begin to sound which is the seventh trumpet angel see the trumpet blast the great trumpet the mystery of God should be finished. Because he's going to be seen from one end of heaven unto the other at the end of Satan's two and a half year reign, which equals the end of the 13th year of tribulation or the end of the sixth year of trumpets. That's why you even read in Matthew 24, 27, for as the lightning that cometh out of the east and shineth unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. This word coming, we've broken it down many times. It shows up, I think, four times in Matthew 24 and in no other uh, synoptic gospel. Because this is about the coming of the Son of Man, feet down on the Mount of Olives as lightning from one end unto the other. This is why you see he's coming on the clouds at the sound of a great trumpet, soon as that seventh trumpet begins to sound, and listen to what it says, that it'll be at the day and hour no one knows. Because it's going to be at the Feast of Trumpets. So if it was Feast of Trumpets at the end of the sixth year of tribulation, and we go the seventh year of seals, uh, at the end of the sixth year of seals, and we go the sixth year of seven, sorry, he comes in Marks at the end of the sixth year of seals on the day and hour no one knows. And it was six years long to that point, which means it started on the day and hour no one knows, which is the Feast of Trumpets. That began the 14 years. So if you take the seventh year of seals, and then you take the next six years of trumpets, and you get to the end of the 13th year, that means the final year will also be the day and hour no one knows. And look at this. But as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it also, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. There it is. That same word. When is the coming of the Son of Man? When he comes as lightning from one end unto the other. And when he comes as lightning from one end to the other on the clouds, at the sound of the seventh trumpet as it begins to sound, it'll be the day and hour no one knows. But you see. Again, as we said earlier, this isn't his gathering. This is when he's now coming to what? Now he's coming to destroy the enemies 
in that final year, which is as it was in the days of Noah. And what does he tell them? Two will be in a field, one taken, one left. Two women grinding, one taken, one left. Now let's go to Zechariah. Now let's go to Zechariah 14, where everybody goes. You see, did does, does the church have, have little parts and pieces in the right place? Yes. But have they missed a little more than half of the tribulation understanding? <laughs> yes, unfortunately. This is why we're trying to reach as many as we can. So they, they understand that that seven years, the trumpet's got to be built first. Unfortunately, it's not the first seven years. It's the beginning of the seven, which is Matthew's portion. So because they all learn from Matthew's portion, they do have it in the right spot, but they've missed the first seven years and the 50 days that come first. So now the temple is rebuilt, but it's rebuilt with the Lord there. It's built by Zerubbabel, and the Lord is there. And the 144 that follow him wheresoever he goes. He said he would receive them when he came to them again with the place prepared. So now all the events of trumpets happen. The temple is built. Messiah is cut off. Satan has two and a half years for which the pit is opened when, he ca when he's cast down. A group flies on the wings of an eagle and they're protected till the end of the 14th year. But here we are at the end of 13 to the start of the 14th year. And this is where the church is also correct about the Lord returning feet down on the Mount of Olives. That this is the post-trib return of the Lord feet down on the Mount of Olives. Well, guess what? They're correct. What they haven't understood is that many people, when they go to Matthew's discourse, is they're going to, they try to tell you that that's pre, even though I've just shown you it's clearly post. How could it be immediately after the tribulation of those days and people try to tell you post? How could it be when he's coming on the clouds as lightning from one end to the other and yet it be post? I mean, and yet it be pre. Uh, pre. It can't be either of them. It can't, I mean, it can't be pre and it can't be mid because it's post when he returns feet down on the Mount of Olives when now the whole world will see him from one end unto the other. And when he said, when he comes, it'll be as the days of Noah, there will be two and one taken, two and one taken. Well, what else do we know is going to happen? There's going to be another battle. There has to be a battle. So now listen to what Zechariah 14 says. Starting in verse 2. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished. Now listen to this. And half. What did Matthew say? Luke didn't say it. Mark didn't say it. What did Matthew's discourse say for that final year? Two, one taken. Two, one taken. What is that? Half. Half. And uh, half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall be cut off from the city. Listen to this. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations that he's gathered together in battle. Listen to this. As when, which means there was a past tense battle that happened first. As when he fought in the day of battle. Ta-da! Now do you understand what that as when battle was? That as when battle was at the end of the sixth year of seals when he came in the great day of his wrath as that stone that crushed the toes destroyed the beast. That was the ten horns from Revelation chapter 17's battle. This You could see it. It's right there in Zechariah 14. He's coming for another battle, and he's telling you that he's coming for this battle as when he fought in this previous one. So now, what is this second battle? that he's going to now fight against those nations. Well, let's go to Revelation chapter 19. And look at what we see in Revelation chapter 19. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he does judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, 
and he had a name written that no man knew but himself, and he he was clothed with a vestiture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And a sword went out of his mouth, and a sharp sorry, and out of his mouth went a sharp sword. With it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. The other wrath was the wrath of the Lamb. Now the wrath is coming from the Lamb, but it's the wrath of Almighty God. He's coming with the wrath of the Father. And when he does, and he has this battle. Remember, at mid-trumpets, the beast came back. So he was, he was not at the end of the six-year seals. Then he is, or shall be, which is at the time when the pit is opened and Messiah was cut off after the temple had been built. And what's he going to do? He's going to go into the temple at that point and declare himself God. So again, you see, the church does have some understanding in that seven years. But unfortunately, they don't realize it's the Lord who's there in the presence while it's being rebuilt, not the enemy. Because everybody believes he's only coming feet down on the Mount of Olives when he's going to be seen from one end to the other. They can never understand the was, is, and shall be of the beast. Because how would he was and then not? Who would have killed him? Except the Lord. Then how on earth does he come back if he's cast into the lake of fire? Because when he was killed at the end of seals, he wasn't cast yet into the lake of fire. He was cast into the pit, which is why when the pit is opened at mid trumpets, he comes back and he's there with Satan and with the false prophet. And all three of them are there for the two and a half years to the end of the 13th year. But now you see when he returns feet down on the Mount of Olives. He's coming to destroy all those nations, the treading of the winepress of the wrath of Almighty God. And then he's going to take the beast and the false prophet. And they're going to be the first two cast alive into the lake of fire. This is Zechariah chapter 14. When the Lord comes, as it says in verse four, and his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. You see, this is when he comes as lightning from one end unto the other. It is why Matthew says it is when he comes at his coming. It'll be immediately after the tribulation of those days. It will be when he's coming on the clouds. He's coming on the day and hour. No one knows, which is at the sound of the beginning of the voice of the seventh trumpet. When it begins to sound, which will be, of course, on the day and hour, no one knows, which is the Feast of Trumpets. And what is he going to do in that final year? Then the Lord shall go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. So now he's going to fight against those nations. And it is the treading of the winepress of the wrath of Almighty God. And we get this description of all of this battle. And, and the, the devastation of it. Listen to what it says in Zechariah 14, 12. And this shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite all the people that have fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall consume away while they stand upon their feet. And their eyes shall consume away in their holes. And their tongues shall consume away in their mouth. This is the battle that the Lord is going to do in that final battle at the coming of the Lord, feet down on the Mount of Olives. Do you follow, brothers and sisters? It is all there in order. Once you begin to understand that these differences in the synoptic gospels of Luke, Mark, and Matthew, that the first will be last, the last will be first. Matthew, Mark, Luke, in the end is Luke, Mark, Matthew. That the differences within the Gospels and especially within the discourses is revealing to you the timings of the coming of the Lord. 
The reason for Luke not having day and hour, no one knows, is because Luke's portion is a period called above 14 years, which is 50 days before the 14 years begins. It is like a rapture called the pre-trib escape of the bride of Christ. They go before all of these things begin, which means before the 14, uh, before the 50 days begin. In Mark's discourse, they're going through all of these things and it begins with nation against nation kingdom against kingdom which is why zechariah 8 as you saw he said i couldn't start rebuilding because i had everyone against his neighbor because the seven years of seals begin with the destruction of jerusalem and world war three breaks out before the antichrist shows up in the mark of the beast and then at the end of the sixth year of seals we see the coming of the Son of Man immediately after the tribulation of those days in the clouds, plural, when he's coming on heavenly Mount Zion, the mountain carved without hand, will destroy the ten toes, the ten horns in that battle, which is when he's coming on the day and hour no one knows, which will be the Feast of Trumpets six years later from the beginning of the 14 years. At which point, he's there on Mount Zion. The 144,000 are there on Mount Zion with him. When the seventh year of seals is over, the seven years of trumpets now begin. The eighth year of tribulation. And in Zechariah chapter 8, there's the Lord on Mount Zion, calling it the mountain of the Lord. And now he says, now let your hands be strong, because now they're going to start rebuilding the temple and the city and the streets. Then, once the temple and the city and the streets are built, we come to having the Antichrist been killed. The beast was killed. In the first half of trumpets, he's not there while the city and the streets and the temple are being rebuilt. The Lord is there. The Zerubbabel, modern-day typology Zerubbabel, is there in charge of rebuilding while Messiah is here. Since the end of the sixth year of seals, he's here until mid trumpets and then other events take place because then the pit is opened. When the pit is opened, the temple is done. The beast comes back. The false prophet is still there. Satan had been cast down. And now the beast as second Thessalonians chapter two, the son of perdition goes into the holy place and declares himself God, not because he built it, but because the pit has been opened and he comes back in the shall come out of the pit and he is going to be the son of perdition going into the temple after they cut off Messiah and Zerubbabel and all of that. And the, the people that were protected are now going to be taken into the wilderness for the final three and a half years of the 14 years of tribulation. Satan's time, the beast, Antichrist's time, is going to be two and a half years. It's going to be a terrible time, worse than even mid-seals was, until Matthew 24, 27, he is coming, is going to be as lightning from one end unto the other, and it'll be immediately after the tribulation of those days, because as soon as the seventh trumpet, which is the beginning of the seventh year, that seventh trumpet sounds, the Son of Man is going to be seen coming on the clouds in that coming as lightning from one end unto the other. At the beginning, immediately at the beginning of the sounding of the seventh trumpet, and when he does, he's coming on the Feast of Trumpets, the day and hour no one knows, to begin the 14th year of tribulation, which is when he comes as Zechariah 14 feet down on the Mount of Olives. It will be the second battle in Revelation 19, whereas the end of Mark was Revelation 17. And when he destroys them, we see that the beast and the false prophet are the first ones cast into the pit. And that year is going to be as it was in the days of Noah. When that final 14th year is now over and done, we come to Zechariah, uh, sorry, we come to Matthew chapter 25, 
we have the story of the foolish and the wise virgins. Now, the pre-trib Gentile bride was taken at the beginning. This is the post-trib Jewish bride, and he's coming on the day and hour no one knows. How do you know? Watch this. This is now the end of the 14th year. It was the one year as Noah. And what happens? It's Matthew 25, 13. Watch ye therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour, because it was one year later. And then what happens? It's 10 more days. And then it's the final jubilee and all the judgment and the unprofitable servant and all that of the final judgment that comes. Do you follow it? It is all there, brothers and sisters. I don't want to make this too long. It's a little bit longer than I wanted. But I hope and pray you can see and understand and that you were able to follow this in order. Please, if you're new to this ministry, if these are all things that are new to you, please go to that intro series. Take your time. Study those first four videos and watch this again. And you will see this open to you like you have never witnessed in your entire life before. And then you can go and study more of the deeper videos in the rest of that intro page on the website and go deeper into the studies that follow. And we've been able to reveal this from the beginning of the creation unto the end of Revelation. And the entire storyline reveals the exact same thing. What was, what is, shall be. Ecclesiastes 1.9. So, brothers and sisters, I pray now you can see and understand that the end of the sixth seal is not the same as the end of the sixth trumpet. There is Luke's portion, Mark's portion of seven years of seals, and Matthew's portion, seven years of trumpets. There is a lot more, much, much more to this, but this is to help give everybody the framework and to see it and to understand it clearly <coughs> excuse me and hopefully to be able to share it with many others i love you all god bless you god bless your families we'll talk to you soon bye for now